begin by <coughs> with a simple question. And the question is this, why are we studying Mark's Gospel? Why are we going to get so much attention to one of the Gospels? If you've been in Hebrew with for a while, you'll know that we've already studied <coughs> Matthew's Gospel in our pulpit ministry and also uh, John's Gospel. I preached John's Gospel, I think, the second year uh, that I was here. So you may be asking the question, we've already been through some Gospels before, why go through uh, another one? So I'm going to try to answer that question uh, before we get started. Uh, one of the reasons that we're doing Mark's Gospel is in light of Christianity Explored. You know that we use <coughs> Christianity Explored, which is a seven session overview of Mark's Gospel. We used that back in the fall. Uh, Christianity Explored is a great outreach tool. It's a great tool to use for sharing the Christian faith with non-Christians. It's also a good review for uh, Christians uh, into the person and, and work of Christ. Uh, so I was thinking that it made sense to uh, focus more deeply on Mark's Gospel in just seven sessions. And so that's one of the reasons that we are using uh, Mark's Gospel on, on Wednesday night. And also this past uh, Saturday, I produced some, or uh, presented to the session, some preaching plans here at Hickory with for the next three years. Um, and in that three-year period, I suggested to the session that we focus on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul talks about his preaching, that his preaching was to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. You will never exhaust the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, and it makes great sense for the people of God to constantly be studying about who Christ is and what he has done. So we're going to be doing that over the next three years. In 2020, I will finish up Romans in March, and then we are going to go to the Old Testament for some studies in the life of Elijah, the prophet, and maybe even Elisha in the fall, depending on how the studies in Elijah go. So that is where we're going to be in 2020. Then beginning next year in January, I'm going to start a study in the book of Psalms. I've chosen 50 of the most famous or most familiar Psalms, Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 8, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalms like that that you are familiar with. And as you know, Psalms, you may not know, uh, Psalms is one of the most quoted Old Testament books in the New Testament because of its betrayal of the Messiah, of the person and work of Christ. And so we're going to use the Psalms. I've wanted to preach from Psalms for a number of years now, and so we're going to get that study started in 2021. And then in 22, uh, 2022, I plan to launch out into that book that terrifies me, the book of Hebrews. And so that is where we're going in the pulpit ministry. Uh, we used Hebrews during the Advent season. It is rich in Old Testament imagery. And so we are hoping that with the studies in Psalms serving as a foundation, then we'll go to this tremendous New Testament book of Hebrews and study more about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we will begin this focus on the person of Christ on Wednesday nights in 2020 by using uh, Mark's Gospel as our, as our foundational study to get this uh, emphasis going in the life of our church. Well, let me ask you first of all tonight, what is the Gospel? If someone were to ask you the question, what is the Gospel? Singular, how would you respond? Uh, I hope that you would say that the word simply means a good message or good news and when applied to Christianity, it refers to the good news regarding Jesus Christ. Turn, if you would, tonight in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Notice how Paul answered this question concerning the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. Beginning to read at verse 1, <clears throat> Paul said, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, and here's the gospel, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, 
And then he appeared to Cephas, or that is to Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born. He appeared also to me. So when Paul defines the gospel for us in 1 Corinthians 15, he simply tells us it is the good news about Jesus Christ, the good news about his death, his burial, and the resurrection. But let me ask safely tonight, what are the gospels, plural? When you hear the term gospels, uh, what books of the Bible do you think about? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Very good. Uh, these are the first four books of the New Testament. They contain the historical record of the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, they record select details about his life. They provide us insight into his teaching, into his ministry, into encounters that he had with people, into his sermons and his parables. They highlight his miracles. Uh, but as we're going to see in Mark and as you see in all the Gospels, the Gospels move toward the Passion Week. They, they move in the direction of Christ's crucifixion and His resurrection. They focus on a lot of things, but they have a focus, and that is upon the sacrificial death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the exact same things that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15. Now when you think about the Gospels for just a moment, do you see some similarities in the Gospels? When you've read them in the past, uh, what are some things that are similar about those four books of the Bible? Or are they different? Well, they all tell about the work of Christ. Okay, very good. There, there's great similarity there concerning the historical details uh, about the death and, and resurrection of, of Christ. Now, are, are there any differences? That there's a major difference in the Gospels that, that I want you to see tonight that no one's mentioned yet. Very good. There, there's a huge difference between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Gospel of John. Um, when, you, when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's almost like they're, they're pulling from a similar source in their story. And you get to John, and John starts with this tremendous theology about the person of Christ in the prologue. And then John structures almost his entire gospel around seven signs or seven miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes to the upper room discourse and then uh, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And scholars have noticed this, and you can see this when you, when you pick up the gospels and read it, that there is a great uh, difference between... John's Gospel and between Matthew, Mark, and, and, and Luke. Uh, so there's similarities with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and this is called scholars, uh, called upon scholars to study this, you know, and see what their explanation is. Most scholars believe that Mark's Gospel was the first Gospel that was written, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as their source, and then they added some things uh, to it. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this tonight. If you are interested in reading a lot of the background issues, your Reformation Study Bible would be a good source. Also, the, the ESV uh, Study Bible would also have some, some information for you there as well. Uh, but some people say that Mark was the first gospel. Matthew and Luke used um, Mark as kind of the foundation of what they were going to, to include in their gospels. And then there was a separate source that was used by Matthew and Luke uh, that contributed more uh, to, uh, to their Gospels than what you find in, in, in Mark's Gospel. But we believe that all of them are, in, they are inspired by the Spirit of God and that the Spirit of God was overriding this whole process as these individuals wrote. Um, now, a third question on I, what is distinctive about Mark's Gospel? When you think about Mark's Gospel, can you think about some things that stand out about it from your own personal reading of it? Very concise. Okay, concise. There's a, there's a brevity to uh, Mark's Gospel. Uh, related to it being concise, there's something that just really stands out when you compare it to the other uh, Gospels. Amen. Okay, yeah, we're going to get to that. 
But you're right. It doesn't have the, the birth. And, or the, 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 yeah, the, 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 the the birth account that, that, that both Matthew and Luke. Right. The, we, we get our birth narratives from Matthew and Luke and not from Mark. In fact, I preached a, a sermon, I believe, for Christmas Eve one time called The, the, God, the Gospel Without a Christmas, and I used Mark as the, yeah. as, the, um, as the source for that, that sermon. So it starts with the baptism, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. How many chapters are in um, Matthew's Gospel? Matthew's Gospel. 28. 28. 28 in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, how many chapters are in Luke's Gospel? 24. 24. Okay. That's alright. <laughs> and how many chapters are in John's Gospel? 21. 21. Okay. And how many chapters are in Mark's Gospel? 16. There's 16, but in actuality, there's not much more than 15, because if you look at some of the uh, verses in the latter part of, of, Ma of Mark 16, uh, there's a great question whether the, the latter section of, of, those, of, of, of um, Mark 16 should have been included in the New Testament canon. There's a lot of debate about that. So there's only about eight verses in chapter 16 that we know for sure that should, should be in there. So when you just look at that, Matthew 28 chapters, Luke 24 chapters, John 21, and Mark 15 or 16, you see there's a brevity to Mark compared to the, to the other Gospels, and that goes with the conciseness that, that Everett was talking about. Now, y'all mentioned that it was action-packed. Uh, what, what did you mean by that? It tells all the, you know, like, uh, the miracles you did. Okay. And There's one word in Mark's gospel that just uh, immediately, exactly, the, the word immediately is it, found 17 times in uh, Mark's gospel. It's found 15 times in the first six chapters. Uh, some of the commentators on Mark's gospel will divide the gospel between the identity of Christ him coming and revealing himself to be the Son of God through the miracles, and you find those miracles, most of them, in chapters 1 through 8. And then in chapter 8 and 9, there is this turning to the passion of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's in that first section uh, of the miracles that the word immediately occurs over and over again. And, and, and you just kind of get that feel as you read through Mark's gospel. There's action here. There's importance here. And um, uh, Mark was an eyewitness to these events along with the other apostles. And it's like the kingdom of God is, is, is breaking into the kingdoms of this world. And if there's an event of importance, there's an event of moment. Uh, there is obviously the most important event in human history. The Son of God has come to earth in, uh, in faithfulness to the promises of God. Uh, so immediately occurs 17 times. Uh, Christ's ministry after his baptism took off with speed and influence and importance. Uh, listen to what one commentator has said concerning this. His name is Donald English. He says this, For the first eight chapters of this gospel, there is a quite breathless presentation of one work of power after another. Mark needs to keep using the word immediately because he is hurrying his readers along from one example of the release of divine energy to the next. So Mark's gospel, it's brief and concise. It has this tone of excitement, of, of action, that there is something of significance that has occurred here on earth. And then there is a purpose uh, in Mark's Gospel. Those of you that sat in Christianity Explored, how does Christianity Explored close? What's the final lesson in Christianity Explored? I think this is mission, wasn't it? His identity, his... Um... Okay, man. <laughs> <laughs> his identity, his mission, and his call. Okay, well, it's his call. But what, what is the call? Come and die. Come and die. Um, listen 
to this, uh, it, it's a little bit of an extended commentary I want to read here, but it's not too terribly, wrong, terribly long. But it's very good, and it gets to the heart of where Mark's gospel takes us in this realm of discipleship. Um, listen to what Mr. English has to say. To the question, how do people in Mark's gospel show faith in Jesus, the answer, to put it bluntly, is that most don't. See, we, we're under this misconception that if we had just lived back then, seen all the miracles, seen all the action, we would have immediately fallen in line. You read Mark's gospel, and that's just not true. It's not true when you read the other gospels either. His family misunderstand and try to deflect him from his course. His own townspeople are almost jealous of him and certainly refuse to accept his claims. The religious leaders are at first cool and later directly antagonistic to the point of seeking his death. The crowd follows, enjoying the teaching and being amazed by it, but in the end they do nothing to save him. Even his disciples, and not least Peter, struggle to understand without ever properly doing so and get things badly wrong. Some of the women are at least faithful as far as the crucifixion, but even their faith fails them at the very end. And listen to this. Only two groups seem to get anywhere near the expected response. The desperate and the demoniacs. The latter at least show signs of knowing who Jesus is, but they get no further because recognition leads to resistance, not faith, till they are delivered. The desperate alone are seen to be faithful. They have nowhere else to go and no future to hope for without a cure. In the main, they cast themselves on Jesus and find all that they need and more. One explanation of this phenomenon of unbelief is the sinfulness of the human heart. Mark makes this plain by drawing particular attention to what it means to follow Jesus. It is likely, as some commentators suggest, that the pattern of concentrating half the gospel on miracles and the other half on the passion is deliberate. The pattern is presented to underline the fact that discipleship is not an unending experience of supernatural power revealed in miracles and powerful teaching. Discipleship is also about lowly, costly obedience to the will of God in facing the sinfulness and evil of human nature in the world. The disciples particularly illustrate how difficult it is for human beings to accept that side of the life of faith. They seem to enjoy all the wonderful works, but they recoil at the talk of the cost. They argue about who will have the seats of honor, both his and theirs. Peter, whose testimony may well lie behind much of what Mark writes, is a particular example both of the good intentions and of the dismal failures of those who were encountered by Jesus. Wow. That gets your attention, doesn't it? It gets uh, my attention. One commentator I read this afternoon in his introduction to Mark's Gospel is that uh, Mark, in all likelihood, is writing from Rome and probably the late... <coughs> Uh, 7th century A.D., somewhere between 65 A.D. and 70 A.D. Um, and if you remember, at, the, at that time in the history of the church, uh, the church was suffering great persecution at the hands of Rome. Peter was getting ready to be crucified upside down. And Mark, in writing his gospel, is writing to such a church, facing such persecution and he's simply reminding them, hey, this is the lot of Christian disciples in every age and in every time facing persecution for their faith. So its purpose was to call people to faith and discipleship in a very, very unpopular time to be a Christian disciple. And then finally, why was Mark chosen to write a gospel? Well, I think when we think about it for just a moment, 
we'll see that he was very qualified to write one of the Gospels. Turn to chapter 14 of Mark and verse 51. It's, it's kind of a humorous story, but most scholars feel like that Mark is describing himself here. I mean, there's nothing funny about what was going on. Um, but it's kind of interesting what happened. This is right after the betrayal and the arrest of Christ. And it says in verse 50, this is Mark 14, that all the disciples left Christ and fled. And then it describes in verses 51 and 52 a young man who was with the disciples, who was also following Christ. And the only thing that he was wearing was a linen cloth about his body. Notice that in verse 51. And the authority seized him. And when he ran away from them, they kept the linen cloth and he ran away naked. And most scholars believe that this is a cryptic way of Mark describing himself here in these two verses. And, and I believe they're right. Um, and and that's, even though he, he ran away scared and he ran away from Christ and his IRMD, this tells us that Mark was an eyewitness to these events. So he has credibility to write a gospel because he was probably a follower of Christ when Christ was, was on earth and saw his life, saw his ministry, saw the miracles, saw the crucifixion and was aware of this. Uh, secondly, uh, Mark was a traveler with the Apostle Paul on Paul's first missionary tour. You see this in Acts 12, verse 25. Now you remember that into the first missionary tour, he left the Apostle Paul. Paul accused him of desertion. And that was the split that occurred between Paul and Barnabas over the issue of John Mark. But you read later, maybe you'll remember from our studies in 2 uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul says, bring Mark with you. It seems like Paul and Mark were reconciled over this in the latter years of Paul's ministry. But nonetheless, if he traveled with the Apostle Paul, he had this close contact with Paul as an apostle, knew about his teaching, knew about his ministry. And then Mark was Peter's helper in Rome. You see this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13. Uh, all of the early church fathers who make comments about Mark's gospel, uh, they all say, and one of the earliest was back at the late, uh, latter uh, part of the first century going into the second century, it was a church father named Papias, P-A-P-I-A-S, who said that Mark was Peter's interpreter. Uh, so most uh, church fathers uh, believed that Mark was essentially the amanuensis or the writer for Peter or at least had close, very close contact with Peter. Um, so, so think about this for a minute. An eyewitness of the ministry of Christ, a witness to the death and resurrection of Christ, a close associate of the Apostle Paul, a close associate, maybe even the interpreter of Peter. Uh, Mark was well qualified uh, to write this gospel. So let us dig in uh, to Mark's Gospel. Next week we will come back and we will look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And again, if you need assistance in getting J.C. Riles a commentary, let Nancy or myself know, and we will assist you in that. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for giving us uh, a historical record concerning the coming of Christ. Uh, thank you for these reliable guides, these faithful eyewitnesses to these events. And we pray that you would use the, the study in Mark's gospel to uh, arrest our attention and to make us think about the cost of Christian discipleship and what it may mean for us in, in our day and time as the world around us and in our American culture, Western culture, gets increasingly hostile to the claims of Scripture and to the claims of the Gospel. I pray that you would use these lessons in Mark's Gospel to strengthen us and make us disciples who are strong and, and who are steadfast in the day in which we have been called to, to live for the Lord Jesus. We pray in His name.